begin by asking you a question, which is, have any of you ever looked at a, a self-help book? Like, <laughs> at, at somebody else's house, or <laughs> at, at the airport while you were waiting for, for a flight. So what I want to try to bring out to you today is how the ideas that you would have found encoded in those self-help books were actually ideas whose origins you can see in the work of the five figures whose images appear on the screen behind me. That is, I want to bring out to you the way in which there's a very serious continuity between the sorts of ideas that you would find in the works of Socrates, who lived in ancient Greece nearly 2,500 years ago, and his student Plato, and Plato's student Aristotle, and the Roman thinkers Cicero and Epictetus on the one hand, so the ideas of these five ancient Greek and ancient Roman thinkers, and the sorts of ideas that you would find in scientifically informed contemporary works that are designed to help people determine how it's possible to take what we know about human nature and transform that into something that allows us to flourish. That is, I want to try to explain to you why the ideas of those five thinkers are the sorts of things that you would have encountered if you had been a student at Plato's Academy in ancient Greece, or if you had been a student in ancient Rome, or a student in the Middle Ages when people dressed like this and looked like that, or if you had been a student in the 19th century in America, or perhaps in the 1950s, or perhaps in the 1980s, that's the Yale University Prom Committee of 1974, uh, or a contemporary student right now, or somebody taking the 26-hour version of this lecture, I promise I won't give you all 26 hours today. But if you decide that you want to spend more Sunday afternoons inside uh, with no sunshine, there's an extended version. So what I want to try to do is to articulate for you five insights, and I'll associate one with each of these five thinkers, that run as a thread throughout these 25 years of West, 2,500 years of Western thought. But I want to <coughs> begin, because I know some of you really are eager to get outside, by telling you what the fundamental insight is that underlies all of the remarks that I'll make today. And that's the following idea. The human soul, and I speak here metaphorically, you can take that term soul and translate it into whatever vocabulary makes best sense to you. So you can think of it as the brain or the mind or the spirit. The term as it's translated from the ancient Greek tradition tends to be translated soul. So the human soul, that is our internal psychological understanding, has a particular kind of complexity to it. In particular, it has parts, aspects, all of us have inside ourselves, aspects to which we have direct access that are conscious, that are rational, that are controllable by a kind of forming of plans and following through on those basis of those plans. And it also has parts which are not directly knowable in that way. It includes both reflective and non-reflective parts. And flourishing occurs when we somehow manage to create the right sort of balance among those parts. The right sort of balance between the reflective parts of the soul and the non-reflective parts of the soul. But the problem is that because we are beings whose souls are both reflective and non-reflective, simple rational understanding of what it is that I've just said could only ever do part of the work. We need both a reflective awareness of the value of harmony and a non-reflective awareness of the value of harmony. That is, we need a proper understanding that's both reflective and non-reflective of the relations between the parts of the soul. Now, the ancient Greek and Roman traditions had very nice vocabulary for expressing the ideas that I've just put up here. The notion of flourishing in the ancient Greek tradition is given the term eudaimonia, where daimon 
means spirit. And eudaimonia we can roughly translate as spiritual well-being. <coughs> so the title of the talk, as it appeared in the program, I think, is Five Ancient Secrets to Modern Happiness. But it's better, I think, to understand it as a talk about five ancient secrets to spiritual well-being, to eudaimonia, to human flourishing. They also had a word in the ancient Greek tradition for what it is to have this kind of understanding that's both reflective and non-reflective. And that term is phronesis, or practical wisdom. The idea is that it's not just a kind of theoretical wisdom, it's a kind of wisdom that's practical as well. So how does this overarching thought get translated into particular mandates by each of our thinkers? Let me, as I said, identify each of the five main themes with one of our thinkers, and then we'll talk through them. So the five ancient secrets are this. The first is that it's important and challenging to cultivate a certain kind of self-knowledge. And we'll draw that lesson from some thoughts of Socrates. The second is the recognition that the soul has parts and that the key to flourishing involves a particular kind of harmony. We'll put that into some ideas from Plato. The third is that we need to develop a strategy for talking to the non-rational parts of the soul. And one of the most effective ways of doing that is habit. So we'll talk about the way in which Aristotle gives voice to the importance of fostering virtue through habit. But of course, we are social beings. We don't do things in isolation. And recognizing the importance of community and friendship and a supportive network is something that we'll take from Cicero. And we'll close, in some ways, coming full circle with Epictetus's insight that part of the way of doing all of this involves recognizing what is and isn't in our control. So let's start with Socrates, great figure of ancient Greece, who, as you can see in this wonderful painting that hangs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, about 90 minutes south of here, is lying on a bed surrounded by his admirers. What he is about to do is to drink from a glass that contains hemlock, which is poison. And the reason he's been sentenced to drink that glass of poison by the city of Athens is because he has been convicted of corrupting the youth. In what did his corruption of the youth consist? It consisted in asking them to challenge all of the things which they had received as truths about the world and asking them to examine them and consider them and figure out whether they were in fact true. So his provocation came from asking people to question and take seriously the possibility that things are not exactly as they appear to be. Socrates' student Plato wrote down in a series of dialogues the story of the trial and death of Socrates. And the story appears in one of Plato's great dialogues called The Apology. And in the story of The Apology, Plato tells the tale many years ago of Socrates' students trying to figure out whether, in fact, they were following somebody that it made sense to follow. After all, if you're questioning the received wisdom of your community, you want to make sure that the person you're following after is one that it makes sense to follow. So one of Socrates' students went to this location. This is the Temple of Apollo. <coughs> and at the Temple of Apollo sat an oracle. That is a figure who was transmitting the words of the god. And this disciple of Socrates, Chirophon, said to the oracle, who is the wisest of all men? And the oracle answered, there is no one wiser than Socrates. So Chirophon comes down the hill and tells this story to Socrates. And Socrates answers as follows. He said, when I heard this, I said to myself, what can the oracle mean when it says that no one is wiser than I am? For I know that I have no wisdom, small or great. So he himself decides to engage in this act of investigation. And so he goes to check in with the other people who have reputations for wisdom. I went to one who had the reputation of wisdom. And when, he be when I began to talk with him, I could not help thinking that he was not really wise, although he was thought wise by many and wiser still by himself. 
Socrates, uh, in the provocative fashion typical of him, indicates to the man that he does not share this assessment of the man's wisdom. Uh, and then returns to his disciples and says, so I left him saying to myself as I went away, well, although I do not suppose that either of us knows anything really beautiful and good, I am better off than he is. For he knows nothing and thinks that he knows, whereas I neither know nor think that I know. So in the face of a certain kind of self-opacity, in the face of the fact that there are many, many things that we do not know about ourselves, about the world, there's still available to us a particular kind of knowledge. And that is knowledge of the fact that we do not completely know ourselves. So Socrates' insight, one of the sources of his wisdom, is the recognition that he in fact doesn't know things of the kind that people generally credit themselves with knowing. And among the things that Socrates is most aware of not knowing are facts about himself. Self-knowledge, that is, requires a certain kind of humility, a recognition of the limits of one's awareness. And in many ways, work in social psychology over the last 50 years has been devoted to exploring just this phenomenon. So in the early 1970s, two social psychologists conducted the following experiment. They took people who were either walking across a suspension bridge, very high suspension bridge, who were not like yesterday's speaker, who we're honored to have here today, capable of doing so calmly. So people walking across a very steep suspension bridge, or people who were seated calmly on a bench at the other side of the bridge. So what they did is they had an attractive and friendly young research assistant come up to people either on the bridge or on the bench and conduct a little survey. And when the research assistant had finished conducting the survey, she gave them her phone number. Anybody of the age that this joke is funny? All right, a few of you. It's a very famous pop song when I was, uh, when I was listening to pop songs. So she gave them her phone number and she said, give me a call if you have any questions about the survey. We all know people who call up don't just have questions about the survey. They're looking forward to continuing conversation. So the question is this, what percentage of the people that she had approached on the bench gave her a call, as opposed to the percentage of people that she had approached on this high suspension bridge? Of the ones sitting on the bench, about 30% gave her a phone call. Of the ones on the suspension bridge, close to two thirds did. Now, why? Well, what's it like for most of us to be on a suspension bridge? Your heart beats a little faster, your skin gets a little sweatier, your palms feel a little tingly. What else produces sensation of fast heart rate, tingling palms, a sensation of slight perspiration, a feeling of attraction? But of course, we don't know the source of the experience in our bodies. We simply read our experience off of what's happening to us. And what the social psychologists began to discover systematically, which many people had been aware of in less systematic ways previously, is that we tend to misattribute the sources of our own arousal. Here's another study done in the same tradition. You bring subjects into a supermarket and you present them with four identical objects, four identical apples, four identical pairs of socks, four identical tins of milk, and you offer them the chance to choose whichever one they want. So if you arrange things in an array from left to right in a nation where people read from left to right, here's what it looks like. About 12% of people choose the object on the far left, about 17% choose the second, and close to 70% choose one of the objects on the right-hand side of the display. But when you ask people, why did you choose the object on the right? They don't say, I chose it because it was on the right-hand side of the display. They come up with some explanation. That pair of socks looked to be made of the finest kind of wool. 
But of course, all four pairs were identical. We misattribute the source of our preferences. But it's not just that we misattribute the source of our preferences, that we misattribute the source of our arousal. We even evaluate the world on the basis of cues that are not indicative of what we care about. So a series of studies conducted just about six blocks from here in John Barge's lab take the following form. You bring subjects into the laboratory and you have them evaluate a bunch of resumes which between subjects are identical. So everybody's evaluating the same set of resumes. Some of the people before they come into your lab when you're bringing them up in the elevator are given a warm cup of coffee to hold. You say, oh, while I take down your information, do you mind holding on this warm cup of coffee? Some of them, as they're coming up in the elevator, given a cold cup of coffee to hold. Oh, well, I fill out this survey. Do you mind holding on to this cup of coffee? And then they get in, and they're asked to evaluate the resumes. And the people who held the warm cup of coffee think those candidates are so warm and capable and qualified and effective. And the people who've been holding the cold cup of coffee think they're kind of cold and not suitable for the job. Or you can do the same study where you have them evaluate the resume on a heavy clipboard or a light one. If they evaluate it on the heavy clipboard, they think, what a serious applicant. If they evaluate it on the light one, they think, what a flyaway candidate. They give much higher evaluations in this as opposed to this case. If people negotiate sitting in a soft chair as opposed to a hard one, and they're much more rigid in their negotiations in the hard chair than in the soft one. Now, all of this is just amusing. All of this is just a way of selling more uh, laundry detergent or whatever it is that you want to sell. But there's also a very serious version of this study. So another version of this study took resumes that were identical and affixed to the top of the resume's name, <coughs> either an unmarked name, like William Jones or John Smith or Mary O'Reilly, or a name typically associated in our society today with a person of African descent name like Tanisha or Lashandra. And resumes with this name, identical, otherwise identical, to resumes with the unmarked names, received only half as many callbacks to jobs. So feeding into our sense making are things like bodily feedback, are things like the fact that we tend to prefer things on the right hand side of the array, are things like association networks that get activated by holding something warm and thinking warm, or holding something heavy and thinking heavy, or getting a cue about a name and having arisen as the result of that a set of associations which may cause you to act in ways that you would reflectively disavow. And we can use the fact that people are subject to these sorts of cues in all sorts of ways. So one of the things that turns out to make people behave pro-socially, that is, behave in ways that conform with society's ideals, like cooperation and honesty and so on, is to put before them a pair of eyes that are looking at them. So here's a study that exploits this uh, uh, office in England, is trying to get people to pay for the milk when they come and take their coffee. So here's what they did. Some weeks, right above the milk thing, the honor system milk thing, that said, please put five pence in here if you want some milk. Some weeks, there were eyes. And some weeks, there were flowers. So week one, there's eyes, and then there's some flowers. And then there's some eyes, and then there's some flowers. Nobody's consciously noticing that the eyes or the flowers are there. They're just putting their money in the milk thing or not putting their money in the milk thing. The weeks that the flowers are up there, basically, nobody puts any money in the milk carton. <laughs> basically, none. How about the weeks that there are eyes? Wow, that's the way to make your money. So one of the things that psychologists have discovered is that if you put a mirror in your room, you will, if you catch images of yourself in that mirror, be much more likely to stick with goals that you have. If you put people in a space where they have the sense of the gaze of another upon them, they're more likely to behave in ways that they would when they are feeling watched. And religion, of course, has been sensitive to this idea as a way of enforcing pro-social behavior for many thousands of years. 
all of these are instances of the lesson of Socrates, that what it is to have authentic self-knowledge is to recognize that you with your multi-part soul have a very thin layer that is accessible to reason, that is controlled by your reflection, and a huge part of yourself that is unknown in that direct way. And the reason that Socrates is better off than those who lack self-knowledge is not because he has better direct knowledge of the other parts of himself, but rather because, in contrast to those who think they know, Socrates is better off because he, the other one, knows nothing and thinks that he knows. I neither know nor think that I know. <coughs> in many cases, we're unaware of the sources of our emotions, of our choices, of our preferences, of our goal pursuits, and self-knowledge includes a kind of knowledge of this ignorance. Now, how is it that we could be beings who are unaware of so much of ourselves? This is one of the central themes that's explored by Plato, pictured here on the left in Raphael's famous painting of Plato and Aristotle from the Vatican. So Plato was interested in how we could be beings of whom the following kind of story could be told. So Plato, in his famous dialogue, The Republic, tells the story of a young man named Leontius. Leontius is coming back to the city of Athens. And on his way up the hill, he's walking along the north wall of the city, and he sees some corpses lying at the executioner's feet. This is sort of like the desire to look at a car wreck, right? It's the idea that there's something that is slightly forbidden, but slightly, slightly appealing. So he sees some corpses lying at the executioner's feet, and he has an appetite to look at them. But at the same time, how disgusting. Why do you want to look at an accident? Ever click on those articles in CNN that you think, I am really going to regret reading? But there you click, right? So he has an appetite to look at them. Same time, he's disgusted and turns away. For a time, he struggles with himself, covers his face, but finally, overpowered by the appetite, he pushes his eyes wide open, rushes towards the corpses, saying, look for yourselves, you evil wretches. Take your fill of this beautiful sight. So here's direct realization, the most familiar experience in the world, of having multiple parts within oneself. A part that's saying to some other part that's in you, is you, isn't you, that's somehow pulling you in another direction. Plato gives voice to this with a number of very powerful metaphors. In The Republic, he gives a metaphor of there being a very small man who's trying to control a kind of spirited lion and then a multi-headed beast. And in a dialogue called The Phaedrus, he gives the following metaphor. He says, let's liken the human soul to the natural union of a team of horses and their charioteer. So there's a charioteer, which is at the front, and <coughs> two horses. One of the horses is a lover of honor, guided by verbal commands alone. The other, a companion to wild boasts and indecency, barely yielding to the goad. So Plato's picture a sort of metaphoric way of representing this common experience is that there's a part of the soul which he calls reason, the charioteer, the rational part, a part of the soul that he calls spirit, which is the positive horse, the one go that you can guide by verbal commands, that's sort of sensitive to things like honor and reputation and what others think of you. And then a part of the soul that he calls appetite which is basically involved in, let's say, what's required for the preservation of this generation and the production of the next one. Uh, <laughs> all right. <coughs> so Plato has this picture that our soul has parts. And there's no question that a moment's reflection helps us realize that, at some level, this is just absolutely right and that we constantly experience conflict among parts of our soul, one part pulling in one direction, another pulling in the other. And Plato
Plato's furthermore absolutely right to point out that though the charioteer can say things about what kind of direction might be appropriate, the normal skills that we have simply talking to ourselves are insufficient. Plato goes on and gives an incredible description in the Phaedrus of how the charioteer needs to use the reins in ways that speak the horse's language to redirect them. So I, for the last five years or so, have been thinking about how to articulate Plato's insight in a way that can help us remember it at moments of decision making. So I've thought about a bunch of cases and tried to give us a language for thinking about it. Uh, and in so doing, I'm taking insights of a kind that you might find in thinkers like Freud or in books like Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. So the cases I have in mind are the following. Suppose we go to visit the Grand Canyon and we step out on this horseshoe-shaped walkway. Has anybody been on that horseshoe-shaped walkway? So you all know that it has a glass floor. And so when you look down, what you see beneath you is a bit like that gorgeous slide that we saw yesterday uh, of the space between the two uh, towers. That is, you see thousands and thousands of feet visually of empty space. But of course, when you're standing out on this horseshoe, you don't believe that you're in any danger. Your belief is that you're totally safe. If you didn't believe that you were on a fully supportive surface, you wouldn't just tremble. You would go right back inside and you would buy a t-shirt that said, I did it, no kidding, this was really amazing, right? You would not stay out there if you didn't believe that you were safe. So how do we describe what's going on in the rest of your soul? I say you believe that you're safe, but at the same time, you have what I call an A-leaf that says, yikes, even though I believe that I'm safe, I nonetheless have this experience of danger. Suppose we're watching a movie. Anybody recognize that fellow? <laughs> he had a different job after that. So we're watching a movie, and the character, let's say it's a cowboy, pulls out a gun and points it towards the room. We duck. Why? Because you believe that the bullets are going to come off the screen and fly into the room? You usually walk out of the theater saying, I'm really glad that this 3D version didn't include the, the real slime climbing off the screen to get me. No, you believe that you're watching a movie, but you have an A-leaf that says to you, watch out. How many of you, speaking of, set yours five minutes fast? I set mine five minutes fast, right? All of you know people who set them five minutes fast. Why? I mean, if you set your watch five minutes fast, when you see this visual presentation, here's what you believe. You believe it's 10 o'clock, right? You set your watch five minutes fast. You haven't forgotten that your watch was set five minutes fast. You know your watch says 10.05. That means it's 10 o'clock. But you have an leaf that says, ah, oh, it's 10.05. I better hurry. Or suppose you're watching a baseball game, and you know it's a rerun, so you know that if the guy tries to steal second, he's going to get thrown out. So you yell at the screen, stay on base, stay on base, right? Why? Because you believe your voice is going to go through the television screen back in time over to the baseball stadium? No, you believe that you're watching a rerun, but your A-leaf makes you yell, don't run, don't run. Suppose that you are... Uh, committed to reducing your corporeal footprint. <laughs> In such circumstances, you believe that this assemblage of uh, organic and inorganic substances is undesirable. Nonetheless, you have an A-leaf, which is pulling you in its direction. Here's something, my example, so you gotta trust me, that's made of the same ingredients. These are Tootsie Rolls, really, Tootsie Rolls. That's coconut. I ran out of baking pans, but I bought this fresh at the grocery store. Do you guys use this for something else? I thought it was the perfect shape for a cake. <coughs> and look, I found this amazing spatula with kind of a filter associated with it. <coughs> right? You're in here on a bright Sunday, sunny afternoon, so I assume you believe me that this is edible, right? I mean. 
if you're not going to listen to my uh, stipulations, you shouldn't be at the talks. You believe me. This is, these are Tootsie Rolls. This is coconut. This is a fresh pan. Nonetheless, your relief is pretty much telling you what you don't want to do. Suppose I ask you to sign the following contract. I hereby declare that my soul belongs only to you, O Satan, and I ask you to, to sign on to this. But I'm, I'm a little worried because I know you all know that MT brush script is Satan's favorite font. <laughs> so I add this at the bottom. This is not a legal contract. It's simply a prop in a psychology experiment. All right? You're still going to experience some hesitation in signing this. <laughs> Why? It's not that you don't believe, oh, oh, I guess Satan would put that at the bottom of a contract. <laughs> you believe that nothing's going to come of putting your name on this piece of fake parchment, but you have this elite that says, I am not going to sign away my soul. Monica Bonvicini exploits this with an amazing <laughs> set of restroom installations. So this is a public restroom that she has installed in a city in Europe. And you can see from the outside that it's fully opaque, though the walls are such that you can't see into it at all. Here's what it looks like on the inside. <laughs> so what's going on here? I mean, really, I just gave you a bunch of examples, all of which in some ways are the most familiar experiences in the world. How is it that we could be beings who know that we're in this, but when we experience being in this, can't, can't, can't talk ourselves out of realizing that the experience that we're having is misleading? And the answer, of course, is that we all have brains that have multiply redundant systems that are processing information using all sorts of low-level and mid-level and high-level processes. That is, that Plato, to a very good first approximation, was right that there's a kind of appetitive part of the soul, a very old and primitive part of the brain that we share with basically all self-moving living animals that there's a slightly newer part on top of that that we share with more complex mammals and other creatures, and that there's a very, very, very small, let's say, charioteer at the front with pretty limited capacity that's able sometimes to keep the rest of the system in line. Now, you might think that what that means is that the front part of the brain, the charioteer, the smarty pants part of our soul, is always going to be the thing that gets things right. And the back part of the brain, the lower part, the older part, the horses, the dummy pants part of the soul, is always going to be what gets things wrong. But it turns out, in fact, that the story is much more complicated than that. Sometimes the information that we get from what you might think of as the lower parts of the soul is more accurate than what our front of the brain, smarty pants, parts of the soul think is right. So one set of studies that explores this are a series of studies done by the University of Virginia psychologist Dennis Prophet. And what he does is he has people stand in front of a hill wearing a kind of heavy backpack. And he asks them to estimate how steep the hill is in two different ways. The first way is that he asks them just to estimate using language, very smarty pants part of the brain, how steep the hill is. And they'll say things like, oh, that hill, it must be 20 degrees. I mean, it's huge. And the hill is like five degrees. And then he asks them, right at the same time, to estimate using their arm, a very old fashioned lower part of the brain, just how steep the hill is. And they get the answer exactly right. You can play the same sort of game with your smarty pants visual system and your dummy pants reaching system. This is the famous Muller Lyer illusion. All of us see the top line segment as being longer than the bottom line segment. That's how your visual system works. These two line segments are identical, and the dummy pants reaching part of your brain would get it exactly right. If I asked you to reach for them, you would reach exactly the same amount. If I painted them on the floor and asked you to paste them, 
you would pace exactly the same number of steps, even though your smarty pants visual system was getting tricked. So it's a pretty tough situation because we have sometimes the right answer from one place and sometimes the right answer from another. And even when we know what it is that we want to do, it's incredibly difficult to get control of ourselves. So in the famous long poem, Ovid's Metamorphosis, we hear the story of a queen named Medea who has fallen in love with a forbidden young target of love, the young man, Jason. And here's a beautiful translation of Medea's experience in trying to escape from a situation where reason is telling her to do one thing and passion is telling her to do another. Meanwhile, Medea, seized with fierce desire by reason, strives to quench the raising fire, but strives in vain. Some god, she said, withstands and reason's baffled counsel countermands. So we get all of this imagery, this feeling of being invaded by something else. This god has come in and is telling her what to do. It's not her. This feeling of a raging fire, this sense that something beyond her has taken on. And she continues, love resistest love my soul invades. Discretion persuades me to do this and affection to do something else. So discretion this, affection that persuades. And here's our key line. I see the right and I approve it to condemn the wrong and yet the wrong pursue. I see the right and I approve it to condemn the wrong and yet the wrong pursue. So I teach university students and I ask them for examples of seeing the right and approving it to, condemning it the wrong and yet the wrong pursue. And they give me examples like this. You can go to the library, you can sit down, you can have your copy of Plato's Republic up. You have approved the right and yet. <laughs> so. Let's see what we have to take from Plato. We have this incredibly powerful image, one that's given voice again in almost every thinker in the Western and non-Western world the last 2,500 years, that we have a kind of internal complexity. The soul, says Plato, is like the union of a team of winged horses and their charioteer. And reactions that we have to the world, mo tendencies that we have to go in one direction or another, come from different parts of the soul. Sometimes they're in harmony, but very often they're pulling us in different directions. And the question is how, when we know what it is that we want to be doing, and we feel pulled in different directions, how is it that we can gain the capacity to regulate, to some extent, these unruly horses? And it's the answer to that question that we'll take from Plato's student, Aristotle. So here's Aristotle's answer. I'm going to give you this quote three times because it's my favorite quote in the history of philosophy. It goes like this. People become builders by building and harp players by playing the harp. So too do we become just by doing just actions, temperate by doing temperate actions, brave by doing brave actions, states of character, that is ways that we are, ways that we tend to respond when we're not paying attention, arise out of like activities. It makes all the, no small difference then, whether we form habits of one kind or another from our very youth, it makes a great difference or rather all the difference. I sometimes put this quote in slogan form as follows. If there's a way that you wish to become, start acting as if that were what you already are. And then that's what you will be. So you can bring this out with a t-shirt that people at MIT wear sometimes. It says, gravity, it's not just a good idea, it's the law. Yale students don't think the t-shirt is funny, but they think it's funny that people at MIT think the t-shirt is funny. <laughs> so 
Why is it either first or second order funny to have a t-shirt that says gravity, it's not just a good idea, it's the law? Well, the reason it's funny is because there's two notions of law. There's a notion of law of the kind that you would learn about at a law school that you would enforce if you were a lawyer. And there's a notion of law that you would study if you were a physicist or a chemist or a biologist. And philosophers have terms for these two kinds of laws. The first kind of law, the kind that you would study at a law school or be concerned with you if you were a lawyer, is called a normative law. It expresses norms or a prescriptive law. It prescribes how you ought to behave. So these are laws like look both ways before you cross the street or don't eat in the library or the art gallery. I'm told there's very strict rules here or speed limit, 65 miles an hour, right? So these are normative laws. By contrast, there are uh, the sorts of laws that you would study in a science class, descriptive laws, is it's rules like if a car hits you, you will die. That's a fact. Crumbs cause book decay or speed limit. 186,000 miles per second. Wow, was I glad when it turned out that that thing didn't go faster than the speed of light. I was going to have to change my slides. <laughs> All right. So normative laws are things that say you should. You should look. You should not eat. You should go less than. Whereas descriptive laws are laws that say things like, it's a fact that. It's a fact that if a car hits you, you'll die. It's a fact that crumbs cause book decay. It's a fact that you go less than 186,000 miles per second, no matter how much you're rushing. Now here's something amazing. We have in us a trick, a neuro neuroscientific trick that's the result of how we're built for turning normative laws into descriptive ones. Patterns of behavior that are initially under conscious control become automatized in such a way that they started off being things that we thought were oughts. And as a result of our doing them over and over, become things that are is's. Habits are tools. Habits are built-in techniques, built-in resources for turning normative commitments, oughts, into descriptive commitments or descriptive facts, is it's. But, and they take the following form. So before I cross the street, I habitually look both ways. And I know that it's habitual because I've been to England. And here's what happens to me when I go to England. I, I, I can't get myself across the street. I'm terrified. I don't know what to do. Obviously, if it were still a reflective principle, which is look first to the right and then to the left, or look first to the left and then to the right, I wouldn't have such a panicked feeling when I go to England. The fact that I find it so overwhelming tells me this is something that's become automatic for me. When somebody hands me an item, I say, thank you. One of the things we try to do in our children is to cultivate in them descriptive facts about how they behave in interactions with others as a result of initially presenting, them to the, presenting these to them as normative laws. And I, in fact, am so terrified about how memory works that I won't let my kids, even as a joke, say math facts that are wrong. Because the truth is, everything you say is in there. There's nothing that ever happened in your brain that doesn't have some residual trace, though it's a lot of accreted stuff atop it. However, it's not like the habit system says, oh, you know what? I'm going to do all the good things and turn those into habits and take all the bad ones and leave those off in another domain. It's also the case, right? This is how the habit system works, that when I turn on my computer, I check Facebook or watch YouTube or play Angry Birds or buy shoes or whatever your particular version of this. It's in square brackets because it's about the person at whose house you read the self-help book. But that person, right, that person in the airport, when they turn on their computer, they always play Angry Birds. That is, anything that you begin to do and repeatedly do starts to become what you do automatically. So this is the central insight of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Here's a beautiful, uh, about 500-year-old edition of the ethics. It's a central idea of a book like Charles Duhigg's Habit Book. I don't know if any of you have 
taken a look at that, but it's a book that attempts to describe habit broadly. And it's the central idea in any good parenting guide. So here's Alan Kasdan's book about how it is that you cultivate in your child dispositions that you reflectively endorse. And Aristotle has told us that if arguments were sufficient by themselves to make people decent, the rewards that they would command would justifiably have been many and large. But it's impossible to alter by argument alone what has long been absorbed as the result of habits. In the same way that you can't say to your dog, please stay off the couch. I got it from Fairhaven Furniture and I really care about its future. You have to convince your dog in other ways that your couch is not an appropriate location. So too can you not talk your habit system of street crossing or angry bird checking or thank you saying or whatever dynamic emerges when you go home from Thanksgiving with your family from emerging in that context if it's a deep-seated habit. It is impossible to alter by argument alone what has long been absorbed as the result of habit. This is what it is to have the sort of multi-part soul which Plato pointed out of which Socrates was aware. So how do we fix things? Oh, I told you you'd see this again. Can I show you how you fix it? You become just by doing just actions, temperate by doing temperate ones, brave by doing brave ones. That is, we alter what we are by acting like what we want to be. And this is what any good parenting guide, and by parenting guide, I mean guide to parenting your actual child or guide to parenting your metaphoric inner child will tell you. What it will say is this, instead of thinking about what you don't want, start thinking about what it is that you do want. And then encourage that behavior. When you get rid of a behavior by rewarding its opposite, that is by causing the person to do the behavior that you ultimately want, rather than simply saying don't do the old thing, but rather substituting in something new, the effects are stronger and they last longer than if you simply say no. The best way to build up a behavior that you want is through reinforced practice in your dog, in your child, in yourself. And of course, this idea that Kasdan has is one that we've seen before. How do we learn a craft? Well, we have to produce what we want by producing it. We become builders by builders, harpists by playing the harp. We become just by doing just actions, temperate by doing temperate ones. That is, any serious book about how to change is a book that is channeling Aristotle. And Aristotle rightly points out that there's a kind of virtuous circle that results from this fact about ourselves. Because what we're doing is leveraging something that is a deep truth recognized by every wisdom tradition, and it's a deep truth recognized by every wisdom tradition because it's a fact about how human beings are built, one of the results is that it becomes a kind of self-perpetuating system. Abstaining from pleasures makes us become temperate. And once we've become temperate, we're more capable of abstaining from pleasures. It's similar with bravery. Habituation in standing firm in frightening situations makes us become brave. And when we have become brave, we're more capable of standing firm. The more practiced we become in a behavior, the less control it requires, the more effortless it becomes, the more it becomes what is descriptively true of us, and the easier it is to change the next circle out that we seek to change. So habits are tools for turning oughts into ises, just as we learn to play the harp by playing the harp, become builders by building, so too do we become just or temperate or brave or moderate or calm or receptive to the world or whatever it is that we seek to become by acting as if that's what we already were. If you would want to become something, act as if that's what you already were. But of course, human beings are not individuals who operate best in isolation from one another. 
we evolved from an intensely social species, pri non-human primates, have incredibly elaborate social orders. And human beings, as we saw already, are intensely sensitive to social approbation, social disapprobation, to the wants and desires of others. And we take most of our cues from people around us. We all naturally imitate one another. If I start taking off and putting on my glasses, you'll start doing it too. You're sitting in a way. I'm looking at the room. Most of you are seated exactly like the person next to you. All of us take social cues from the world. And this is something to which the great Roman orator Cicero gave voice in a beautiful way. Cicero wrote famously, how can life be worth living without the mutual goodwill of a friend? Is not prosperity robbed of half its value when you have no one to share your joy? Friendship improves happiness and abates misery by the doubling of our joy and the dividing of our grief. In the face of a true friend, one sees, as it were, a second self. So there's two main claims that Cicero's making here, both of which get supported in the contemporary vernacular of cognitive science, cognitive psychology, through experimental work. The first is this idea that being surrounded by other individuals actually magnifies joy and reduces grief. And the second is that in the face of another individual, it's possible to reconfigure the conception of the self through a kind of structured imitation. So let's talk about each of those. So the psychologist Jonathan Haidt, whose wonderful book, The Happiness Hypothesis, does a sort of similar exploration to this lecture of ancient philosophical texts and contemporary writings, points out the following. If you want to predict how happy somebody is or how long they'll live, you should find out about her social relationships. Having strong social relationships strengthens the immune system. It extends life more than quitting smoking, though you should also quit smoking. <laughs> it speeds recovery from surgery. It reduces the risk of depression and anxiety. That is the single best predictor of long-term flourishing is being embedded in a social network. Now, you remember a while ago that I gave you this example of trying to estimate how steep a hill was. And I said that if you put a heavy backpack on a person and you stand them in front of a hill and you ask them to estimate how steep it is, they'll get it really, really wrong. A very mild hill, like five degrees, they'll say it's 20 degrees. Unless, unless you have them stand next to a friend when they make the estimate. And then what happens? Participants accompanied by a friend estimate a hill to be less steep compared to participants who are alone. Participants who think you just need to imagine your friend, and it activates this, of a friend during an imagery task saw the hill as less steep than participants who thought of a neutral person or a disliked person. So the idea that social structures, that connecting with others can affect our apprehensions of joy and grief, something of which we were all at some level aware. But look, it affects everything. It affects our perception of the physical world around us. Now, at some level, none of this should surprise us. We all learned about hot coffee cups and heavy clipboards activating association networks that then allowed us to experience the world in particular ways. But learning that there are very specific things that have great value, like friendship, that can, in other domains, help us get more accurate information about the world is, I think, a non-obvious application of those insights. And this idea that it is through connection to others that a certain sort of positive change is possible is, of course, an insight that's not limited to the Western tradition. And most of the lecture has been devoted to insights from five great Western philosophers and from a sort of psychology research program that's associated with the Western Academy, mostly because that's what I know more about. But obviously, any of you who is familiar with any of the other great wisdom traditions realizes that most of what I'm saying has its analog in those traditions. So the Buddhist tradition speaks of this idea through the concept of right association, of surrounding yourself 
by a community of others who support you in your goal. And just as Plato uses the metaphor of the charioteer and the horses, the Buddhist tradition uses, well, use the animals that are around you. It uses the example of the elephant. So here's a discussion of how you can exploit friendship in positive ways. When a wild elephant is to be tamed and trained, the best way to begin is by yoking it to another elephant that has already been through the process. By contact, the wild elephant comes to see that the condition it's being led to is not wholly incompatible with being an elephant, that what's expected of it heralds a condition that does not contradict its nature. Surround yourself by people who are acting in ways that you yourself have as a goal. And all of the explicit and implicit processes that you have for social cognition will kick in and help you follow, help you imitate in the same way that you're imitating the person sitting next to you. The constant, immediate, and contagious example of a yoke fellow of somebody who's behaving in the ways that you yourself desire to behave can teach you as nothing else can. Training for the life of the spirit is no different from training for the life of the elephant. So final bit of this fourth lesson, and then we'll move to our final friendship, says Cicero doubles our joy and divides our grief, positive social contact magnifies emotional pleasure, it tempers emotional pain. In the face of a true friend, a person sees, as it were, a second self. In the presence of others, we can develop new patterns of perception and response. So final lesson to bring us full circle. This one comes from something that's not just metaphorically a self-help book, it's literally a self-help book. This is Epictetus, this is actually John Adams' personal copy of it. Uh, everybody read this book, including our early presidents. So this is Epictetus, who is a Roman thinker who was born a slave and achieved freedom in his early 20s. And one of the things, he was a, a subscriber to a philosophical school known as Stoicism. One of the things Epictetus tried to do was to produce what he called a handbook which was a collection of about 100 aphorisms that were designed to help people structure their lives in ways that would help them flourish. And his recipe for eudaimonia, that is flourishing of the spirit, is this. That what we need to cultivate is what he calls ataxa, ataraxia, which is peace of mind, and what he calls apathia, a kind of freedom from destructive passion. And the way we do it is as follows. We learn to res respond appropriately to experience by dividing the world into two categories. Things that are in our power, things that are up to us, and things that are not in our power, that are not up to us. And we do this by developing informed expectations that reshape our perceptions and desires. That is, we seek to control only that which is within our control. And we seek to control indirectly that which is within our indirect control. And then we let go of the things that lie wholly beyond the scope of our control. And we structure our social relations in ways that help us to sustain our commitments. So here's the famous opening passage. Some things are up to us and some things are not up to us. Our opinions are up to us and our impulses, our desires, our aversions, in short, whatever is our own doing, our evaluations of the world, our assessment, what we take things to be, how we take them to matter to us. Here's things that are not up to us, our bodies in their crude sense, our possessions, our public reputations, the things that lie beyond the scope of our control. And says Epictetus, if you suppose that things that are not up to you are up to you, you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna get frustrated. You will be disturbed, you'll find fault, you'll feel like nothing's going the way you want it to, but of course it wasn't up to you what way it would go. By contrast, if you restrict the scope of what you try to control and you control things in the ways that they are controllable, then you're going to be happy. 
If you think that only what is yours is yours and that what is not your own is not your own, then no one will ever coerce you. No one will hinder you. You will blame no one. You will accuse no one. You will do no single thing unwillingly. Now, I know I saw some nods in the audience that my guess is this reminds some of you of this, something. I ask my students this. I say, does this remind you of anything? And they can, they have little clickers and they push one. Yes, and I can tell you precisely what it is. Yes, but oh, I can't remember exactly what or huh? And my students, about 50% of them have some clue and about a quarter on each side know uh, what it reminds them of. So those of you who are wondering, what does it remind you of? Well, it's this. It's, of course, the serenity prayer, right? So here we have it decorated with morning glories, or you can get it with a dog, or if you want a version with a fairy, or uh, you can have it with this smiley girl, or this is my favorite, on an ashtray. <laughs> Or you can even get it, uh, these are three serenity prayer tattoos if you want never to forget this. So there's something going on here, right? I mean, here's Epictetus's basic insight, given voice in a contemporary version. But the basic picture is exactly the same throughout. The idea is this, some things are up to us and some things are not. And though there are many things in the world that we cannot directly control, here's something over which we have an extraordinary degree of control. Our apprehension of things, our predictions about things, how we decide to interpret a given experience is something that's entirely up to us. But how do we know what is and isn't in the scope of our control? The answer is that we kind need to cultivate a particular kind of self-knowledge. So I want to close, having gone full circle, with an example of an individual who took Epictetus's insights particularly seriously in a sort of domain with which perhaps some in the audience have had experience, but which is, to my mind, much more extreme than anything I ever expect to encounter. So does anybody recognize this gentleman? It's James Stockdale. He was Ross Perot's vice presidential candidate. He was also a companion of John McCain for five years in a prison camp in Vietnam. And Stockdale wrote a little book called Testing Epictetus in the Laboratory of Human Experience in which he described his experience in Vietnam having just read the handbook, the little book that I just described to you. Here's how his book begins. On September 9th, 1965, I flew at 500 knots right into a flak trap at treetop level in a little A4 airplane, the cockpit walls not even three feet apart, which I couldn't steer after it was on fire. After ejection, I had about 30 seconds to make my last statement in freedom before I landed in the main street of a little village right ahead. And so help me, I whispered to myself, five years down there at least, I'm leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus. Ready at hand, this is a slogan from Epictetus's handbook, the Enchiridion, as I ejected from that airplane was the understanding that a stoic always keeps separate files in his mind for two things. A, those things that are up to him, and B, those things that are not up to him. Another way of saying this is A, those things that are within his power, and B, those things that are beyond his power. Still another way of saying it is A, those things that are within the grasp of his will, his free will, and B, those things that are beyond it. All the things in category B are external, beyond my control, dooming me to fear and anxiety if I covet them, if I make my happiness dependent upon them. All the things in category A, by contrast, are up to me. They're within my power, within my will. They are proper subjects for my total concern and involvement. They include my opinions, my aims, my aversions, my grief, my joy, my judgments, my attitudes about what's going on, my own good, my own evil. So here's someone in a situation where you might think there's no possibility of flourishing in such a circumstance. Taking the lessons of the five thinkers that we've been looking at and determining what is and isn't 
within the scope of his control as a human being. Recognizing the importance of self-knowledge, the realization that there are parts that he can control rationally and parts that are subject only to other kinds of control. Realizing the ways in which acting in a particular way will make that what you have become. Recognizing, as he writes later, about the importance of being surrounded by a network of others. And finally, in the exact words of Epictetus, realizing what is and what is not in his control. So those are the five lessons that seem to me to be profoundly captured both in the ancient Greek tradition and in the tradition of contemporary cognitive science. And that, I think, should give us all reason to flourish as the kind of complex beings that we are without expecting things to be easy, because this gives us a sense of why they are not. So I'm open for questions for 20 minutes. And thanks to all of you for listening.